friends. Uh, hi friends. I hope you all feel well. So my name is Julia, and together with my partner Mick, we run the Biohacking Congress platform dedicated to furthering of advancement of biohacking, health optimization, longevity, as well as biotech, digital health, healthy and uh, wellness companies. We are happy to host this webinar for you today. Thank you for joining us. Why do we do this? Because we think that our health is our prime and the most important resource to build all aspects of our life. Very often people don't pay enough attention to their health. They used to manage health uh, to resolve some problems, to reduce suffering. I think that uh, we have to reconsider what is health for us. And uh, Biohacking Congress team, together with our experts, put in the effort to make biohacking a culture uh, because it is attitude towards yourself. It is leadership and the responsibility towards your health for your better and longer live. Please follow Biohacking Congress on social media and please attend our events. You can find all the list on our Eventbrite. I am happy to invite you to our big virtual Biohacking Congress on July 17th. There you have to be if you are interested in becoming the best version of yourself. So I think that you know that the key to being and staying Healthy is prevention, and uh, using measurement is a big step in understanding important information that can help you to set up and meet your healthy goals. So today, our enlightening webinar on the topic measurement and managing health, and today our speakers, Boomer Anderson, biohacker, the founder and podcast host at Decoding Superhuman, and uh, Chief Organizing Officer for Europe for Health Optimization Practice, Nonprofit Organization. And one more great speaker with us, Svetoslav Khanenko, biohacker, family doctor, an expert in personal and public health care, founder, a CEO, and Chief Medical Officer at SQ Lab, the first biohacking clinic in Eastern Europe. Boomer, Svetoslav, thanks for supporting us on our mission. Thanks for being our speakers. Please tell us a little bit more about yourself. First introduction of Boomer and then Svetoslav, just a little bit of information. Uh, I was hoping you'd go with Svetoslav first, but that's okay. Uh, oh, okay. You know, just, just briefly, you know, about myself. Uh, my name is Boomer Anderson. Yes, I do all the things that Julia mentioned. And I'll get more into what I do a little bit later in the presentation. But essentially, I work with op um, entrepreneurs to optimize their health so that they can go out and change the world. Uh, we do that predominantly through the use of data, which we're going to talk a little bit today, uh, behavior change, as well as using technology for feedback loops. But Svatoslav, over to you, my friend. Thank you. Thank you, Boomer. Thank you, Julia. Thank you, Mick. Uh, my name is Dr. Svetoslav Hanenko. I am a biohacker. I used to manage uh, my health. Uh, in a very deep way during the last four years. And I uh, have been tracking uh, above uh, 2000 parameters last four years and uh, reach a positive dynamic uh, about 15, 20% each year, measurable and protocolized. Um, I'm also a family doctor, used to study and practice preventive medicine, anti-aging medicine, family medicine, <clears throat> you, whole, whole my life. and. Uh, uh, four years ago, we launched the first biohacking clinic in Eastern Europe, and I started to help other people uh, manage, uh, measure and manage their health, to split, to quantify their health, and to make it measurable and to help them reach their goals. Because in my opinion, biohacking, it's not only about prevention, not only about uh, analysis, not only about medicines, it's about quality of life, about performance in all areas of life. So that's briefly about myself. Uh, thank you very much for this short introduction. I also would like to ask a few questions to our guests to better understand who is our audience today. 
So, uh, Mick, let's show first question. First question to guest uh, is uh, where are you now on uh, the biohacker scale? So, dear guest, you see the question and you have uh, three answers. Please uh, choose one of the answers. So, first answer is I have been uh, using some practices and technologies uh, and tracking results for some time already. Uh, second option, I would like to start biohacking journey and I am learning from books and blogs now. And uh, one more answer, I don't know what is biohacking. So please just uh, choose one answer and we will see uh, who you are <laughs> on biohacker scale. And so one more question to guests, uh, please uh, write to chat. Uh, did you use uh, quantified self technologies? So did you use any technologies? Just uh, write us uh, uh, some names of these technologies and uh, later we will discuss it. So, Mika, do we have answer? Results? Yeah, I guess, uh, well, almost everyone voted like 80 percent if anyone else and uh, we will stop and the poll okay so and here is the result okay so see we have pretty knowledgeable audiences looks like so 55 percent <laughs> uh, uh, know some practices uh, and technologies on uh, biohacking and some of them just starting the journey 27 percent and only 18% don't know anything, which is just a couple of people. Uh, but yeah, that, that is pretty cool. And uh, oh. also we have some answers uh, in chat, yes? Uh, yeah, well. Okay, we will, discuss, we will discuss technologies later. Good, good. We will discuss technologies later. So the next part of our webinar will be our speakers' uh, lectures. Uh, Boomer Svetoslav, you know that uh, I consider you a great specialist and me personally, I learn from you. And uh, before you will start your lectures about uh, how to measure and manage health, please, let's uh, determine what is health. Uh, Boomer, uh, last uh, Saturday on our webinar about uh, health uh, optimization medicine and practice together with Dr. Sharon, together with Dr. Pai, you recommended uh, uh, the de determination that health is A plus B plus C, where A is um, absence of disease, B is balance of metabolic and uh, catabolic processes, and uh, C is cycle of life of the organism. Good, this is your, this is your version. And uh, Svetoslav, I remember your performance in our biohacking congress in London, and you recommend that, uh, that uh, health uh, is uh, measurable well-being of body, mind, uh, spirit, social connections, and environment. So please, let's have a uh, conversation about what is health. Uh, I would like to hear from you. What is health? I can start if you, if you wouldn't mind. Yeah. Uh, so first of all, uh, I think that uh, the, the most, the biggest problem today in healthcare, that healthcare doesn't care health anymore. It cares <laughs> diseases. So the object of uh, still so-called healthcare system in 99% of cases are, are diseases. Specialists are in diseases. I mean, therapeutist is a specialist, not in the uh, normal function of internal organs, but in diseases of internal organs. Ophthalmologist is not specialist in normal uh, status of uh, uh, vi vi system of vision. It's a uh, specialist in diagnostic and treatment of diseases. Diseases, for today, it's a uh, formal uh, classification. There is formal classification of diseases, the 11th version for the current version, which is, works. And it, it is, is so big that it uh, includes uh, the simplest uh, malfunctions, structural, functional uh, of our body or, or mind or spirit. So we cannot say that still, and still we have a determination of health since 1948, uh, also 
considered by World Health Organization that health is uh, um, complete well-being of uh, so uh, literally it's um, complete status of complete physical uh, mental and social well-being and not just absence of illnesses so I think that the, the biggest problem for today is that health has to become object but it w- if we would consider health is as absence of disease and we still will keep in, keep in touch uh, with classification of diseases then we will see that everybody has diseases so we cannot uh, uh, treat health seriously if we just um, put it opposite to diseases everybody has diseases but at the yeah. same time uh, we doesn't have to, to 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 treat health as it is something which is disappears if a disease comes health is like in um, video game its health power scale is our energy scale which provides us all resources in our life to perform better to perform well in any area of life and the bi- one of the biggest issues that we have to understand is that health is not absolute category it's not like something with no malfun- no malfunctions no problems it's like um, ideal status it doesn't exist but still if if we have some problems with structures or with functions of organs we still have have uh, health and we have to understand that health the more we have um, um, defects in structures and functions of organs the less we have health the, the the less we have these malfunctions the more we have health and the more we have health the more we have energy so we have to manage health instead of uh, making primary focus on diseases we have to track it we have to put goals based on health and we have to manage it not only to suffer not to suffer or not to die we have to manage health to reach better performance in all areas of life uh, look Svatoslav and I are good friends. Well, Julie? I remember that health optimization medicine is shifting paradigm away from illness and cultivating mm-hmm. healthiness. So what about your statement? Sure. So let, let's talk about that. So, uh, you know, Svatoslav and I are very good friends. And so uh, not surprising that I'm not going to disagree with him on very much. What he said at the beginning uh, is very, very correct in the sense that healthcare right now, as we call it, is not actually healthcare. Uh, healthcare is a, uh, if, if you go to a doctor, for instance, not many people go to their doctor, with, with the exception of me when I used to try or when I still try to do these things. Not many pe- people go to a doctor and say, hey, how to take me, can you take me from 80 to 100 or 100 to 110? How do you make me a better human? Uh, a lot of people go to the doctor only when they're sick, only when they can't get out of bed, and only when they're in a state of symptomatics. Uh, that is actually disease care, disease management. And look, I'm not going to bash that because we do that incredibly well in a lot of countries, uh, both the country that I'm sitting in now and the country that I'm from. If you get shot, you probably should not go see somebody and ask for health optimization. But on the other hand, there's this broader need, if you will, uh, to have a manager of health in the good times so that we actually can take a peek under the hood from time to time. And I know Dr. Kaneko does this in his practice as well, but you take a peek under the hood, see how the hood's working from a biochemical perspective. And then we're able to just shift those using nutrient lifestyle balancing uh, and able to really optimize the human and optimize their health. So what you actually get there is a very good formula for really just health management over time. And what we're seeking to achieve is something uh, called health span, right? So we're not looking at lifespan necessarily in terms of let's live until 80 or 90, but be sick for 40 of it, I would rather live until 80, drop dead on that day and be perfectly healthy and functional the entire time. And so that's what we're seeking is health span. Uh, But the health manager and the role of the health manager is something that health optimization medicine and practice, the non-for-profit that I'm a part of, is pushing forward as uh, 
something that really needs to exist in this world. And I know that there's doctors out there doing a lot of this already, uh, but we want to call them, you know, to the movement because I think there's, there's room for all of us to push this agenda forward. And my mentor, Dr. Theodore Achikoso, created the framework about 10 years ago in Manila. He's been working on it his entire life. And I encourage everybody to just engage in today's conversation. Uh, good. So I think that uh, we uh, determined a little bit what is health. And uh, next part of our webinar will be a uh, uh, lecture from Boomer and then from Svetoslav Dieck. Yes, so we will uh, have Q&A session after uh, this uh, part of uh, event. And uh, please write your questions to Poo. Mick will explain how to write questions to Poo. And after presentations of uh, speakers, so I will rank you in the sessions with guests. And we can start. Boomer, you can share your screen and start sure. the presentation. And thank so, you, everyone who watched us on Facebook. So, um, Mick, Yulia, I, I want to thank you so much again for organizing this today, uh, the Biohacking Congress. This is now my third a presentation with you guys and we did the first one in London in February 2, 2020. I remember that date quite fondly. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, and then now we did one last week on health optimization, medicine and practice. And today we're going to be talking about one of my favorite topics, which is measurement and how to uh, measure one's health, quantify health, uh, looking at both from a quantified self perspective, but also with lab testing. And so let me share my screen. Um, I haven't perfected the virtual health summit uh, presentation yet, but we're going to have some fun today, guys. And so if you're tuning into this right now, uh, what I would love to hear from you is just it, put it in the chat because I, I'm a geek for geography. And I would love to hear where you're tuning in from. I saw some names from last week, uh, and I know roughly where you guys are from in the world. But let's get started. So uh, the title of my presentation today is Measuring Your Ecosystem. And I think it's the hidden tool and performance that a lot of people are overlooking. Uh, a lot of people that I speak with, you know, are looking for the next quick fix. They're looking for the next thing to do. And yet they're failing to acknowledge what they're doing already. And they don't really know what exactly is happening under the hood. And so I want to start off this presentation by talking about elephants because elephants are of course cool beautiful and uh amazing i was actually in namibia about a year ago uh playing around with some elephants not riding them like you do in chiang mai but getting to see them in the wild and this uh, the reason why i have this slide here is because there's an old sufi proverb and it's actually uh it's debatable whether it's sufi or if it's something else but it's called the blind man and the elephant and the story goes, essentially, uh, a king of this local city uh, traveled over to a, a city that contained only blind people. And he brought his herd of elephants with him. And the blind people all came out and they greeted the elephants. And they said to, they just kind of greeted the elephants, petted them a little bit, and then went back into their village. Uh, when they're asked exactly what uh, they saw or didn't see, actually, what they felt, they all described it in different ways. And they were all wrong because they couldn't see the full picture. And what I like to glean from this proverb is that perhaps we're not seeing the full picture or the full picture is more than just what you touch and what is on the surface. And so what we're going to delve into today is the idea of measurement. Now, everybody has heard this quote by now. And if you've heard any self-help book, it gets quoted all the time. It's what gets measured gets managed. And the gentleman on the right side of the screen is Peter Drucker. Um, what's interesting about this quote is that it's wrongly attributed to Peter Drucker. Yes, of course he said it, but the person who originally got credit or should have gotten credit for it was Lord Byron. Now, not only does Lord Byron have a worse picture than Peter Drucker, he probably didn't have as much of a PR person back in the 1800s. So when we're talking about measurement, there's a few things that I want to get across today. Uh, the main benefits that I see to measurement and how to use it within one's health are to gain an assessment, uh, to establish a baseline, but also to use it as an acceleration for behavior change. And so over the course of today, I think there's are three kind of core benefits that I want you to get out of this presentation. And I want you to have some fun. 
And please uh, remember, I do sometimes curse. I apologize if that offends you, but I do believe that, you know, sometimes it's just fun to have a little shit in the way and have some fun with this presentation. So my name is Boomer Anderson, as I mentioned before. Uh, you know, the name Boomer used to strike in an instance of like, hey, you're a baby Boomer, or hey, how did your parents know uh, or name you this? But uh, due to some interesting trends in society, the phrase, okay, Boomer, uh, got very, very popular. And in fact, in my current uh, living country, which is the Netherlands, uh, it was the number one most popular word of last year. And so, as I mentioned before we went private here, uh, I work with entrepreneurs who are changing the world to help them optimize their health. That is my predominant core business, but I also have this amazing podcast. And I say it's amazing in the sense that I just love talking to really smart people who are up to great things in the world. Dr. Kaneko, I'm going to get you on at some point. Uh, but that's one of uh, my businesses. And I'm also involved in a few other, uh, few other organizations. So Health Optimization Medicine and Practice, is a non-for-profit teaching doctors and health practitioners how to optimize for health rather than to uh, treat for disease. And then I'm also involved in transcriptions, which is why my tongue is a little bit blue right now. And we can talk a little bit about what the benefits are of that later, should you want, put a question in the chat. And I'm involved in a company, a new startup company called Weldium, which is uh, looking to fix supplement distribution within Europe. And these are just a couple of the projects that I'm involved in. And, you know, there's a couple more, but I don't want to announce what they are before pre-launch process. I've been very blessed to speak on a number of different stages around the world. Uh, this includes the Quantified Self Institute, which is some of what we're going to talk about today. I've also done a TEDx talk on the idea of measuring your ecosystem. Been featured on a few different podcasts. Went to Dr. Kaneko's uh, amazing conference last year in Kiev as well as the Biohacking Congress in London earlier this year. And so you can say that you know, speaking has become somewhat of a hobby, fun time for me, but it's also a way for me to see the world. And so let's go back to what we're gonna really achieve here today. And so if I could just have three asks of you guys or three things that I would like for you to get out of today, it's how to use these different tools for assessment, um, both in terms of your biochemistry, but also in terms of establishing a baseline for where you are now. And then I also want to talk a little bit about how we can use tools like quantified self tools to accelerate behavior change through feedback loops, which is one of my favorite topics. And frankly, it's extremely successful if you set it up right. So let's talk about the current state of measurement. And I'm going to talk global to individual. If you've had the opportunity, or actually, let's frame this as a question. Drop this in the chat, guys. I would love to hear a little bit more from you. In case you can't tell, I'm going to be very interactive as we go through this. But drop it in the chat if you get an annual physical. Just simply say yes or no in the chat. And I would love to see, you know, maybe Yulia, if you can, just tell me, because I'm going to keep talking. Just tell me when we have sufficient numbers and just see how many people roughly get uh, an annual physical. But uh, let me talk a little bit about what the annual physical process for me was growing up and until I took a different approach. So every year, I was very fortunate, I would go to the doctor, I would get a checkup, and sometimes they would do a blood draw, and when I got older, they definitely did blood draws, they would do urine samples, etc. And they would check for different biomarkers. Now, these biomarkers, uh, which we alluded to a little bit last week in last week's webinar, included things like thyroid stimulating hormone. Now, thyroid stimulating hormone is a biomarker to roughly assess the health of your thyroid. As both Dr. Kaneko and I will tell you, there's a lot more to that. But what is interesting about when they, they give you the results back when it comes to things like TSH is what they don't tell you is when they're comparing you to reference ranges, depending on what lab you are using, you may be getting compared to a population that is not necessarily representative of you. Uh, for instance, in certain cases, there are labs out there who have a reference range for TSH that contains both 12-year-olds as well as up to 70-plus-year-olds. 
if you think about that as a person who I'm 34 right now, but at the time when I was looking at these kind of biomarkers in a different way, it was in my sort of late twenties. And if you think about that, you're determining health or what, you know, whatever is health to you. Uh, you're determining health by a reference range, which may not be representative of yourself. And I think what we're getting to, or what we've got to at this point is a state and society, and this is a graph of projected BMIs around the world, a state and society where we're all doing, trying to figure out what will work for all 7 billion people at one time. You see this particularly in the diet industry where people proclaim that, yes, keto is good, carnivore is good, vegan is good, vegetarian is good, paleo is good. All of this stuff is good. It's really, really confusing. And it also causes a lot of decision fatigue. And as a result, people don't know what to do. People make interesting decisions and they end up going down the wrong path or they may just not care to engage because they've been told so many different things over so many different periods of time. The end result here is we've seen an increase in BMI, of course, from 1970 until now, but also we see projected increases in BMI because, well, there may be a better way to look at this. Uh, in case you can't tell, both Dr. Kaneko and I uh, earlier agreed on the idea that we need health management, not necessarily disease management. And so health management means rather than looking at very large ecosystems, like this is the score risk charts for cardiovascular disease uh, within the European Union, a very large ecosystem as it, set, as it is. And remember, an eco ecosystem is a community of biological organisms within an environment. This one is greater than 200,000 people across several different cohort studies. Uh, we're looking at things like cholesterol. We're looking at things like smoking status, gender, et cetera, et cetera. And yes, there'll be a quiz on all of this later. But what they don't tell you is that if, there's le if you're less than 30 years old or if you're 30 years old, there's not enough data on you. And so we want to make sure that rather than looking at global ecosystems or just ecosystems in general. We want to look at individual ecosystems. And so what is interesting about the world we live in right now and what is really, really exciting to me is that we can take these tests that were once N of 7 billion, these news recommendations that seem to come all over the place. I remember Gawker was a particularly bad one before they went bankrupt. But you would get these recommendations on these different diets and all these things. And you can take all of that information and now we can put a filter on that information and bring it from global to individual. So rather than looking at everything from an N of 7 billion, we actually can look at it from an N of 1. And so Dr. Kaneko and I will probably have different diets. Yulia, you and I will have probably different diets. And Mick and I will probably have different diets. That's okay. But we can determine a lot of what we need individually through measurement. And so this is a very, very exciting time. And so let's go back to that idea of the organism and the ecosystem. So one of the things that we like to talk about in health optimization medicine and practice is the idea that we are actually a collection of organisms. And I want everybody here to think about this for just a moment. If you think about organisms or an ecosystem as a collection of biological organisms in an environment, what you can very quickly realize is that we are an ecosystem in ourselves. We have fungi. Perhaps the most famous fungi uh, of all in our, our bodies is candida, uh, maybe, and there, there could be a few others. There's viruses, of course, there's one that's very popular to talk about right now, and I'm going to avoid. Uh, there's the gut microbiome and the species of bacteria that exists within it. It's also in your skin and in your mouth and so many different places. And the food interacts with our gut microbiome and can shift our behavior. The gut has been called the second brain. I would argue that it's very much connected to the brain and it's very intertwined. And all of these ohms, if you will, so the, the microbiome, the virome, uh, the genome are all taking cues from our external environment or something called the exposome. And collectively, all of these ohms have a name. 
and that's called the holobiont. And the holobiont is something that was originally uh, proposed by Dr. Lynn Margolis. And what really it addresses is the idea that we are that collection of organisms. It was introduced to me by my mentor, Dr. Theodore Achikoso. And so if we think about health now as not just the numbers that we have on the, the, the pages when we we're getting our, our annual physical growing up, but rather the health of our organisms, we could start to look at testing and measuring this in a very different manner. And so what we're actually looking at when we start to test and see the health of our organisms are we're looking at something called the metabolome. And the metabolome is, uh, if you think of the genome as the blueprint of where you should be, the metabolome tells us where our cells are currently and where they have been. And so we can look at things like the Krebs cycle, which is featured here, and assess the different enzyme-driven chemical reactions and see exactly what nutrients a person needs at any given time. Now, what are the benefits of this? And I'm gonna take you guys through a case study here in a second. But the benefits here are knowing what supplements to take, knowing what diet is right for you, knowing uh, what lifestyle modifications you may need in order to live your best life. And this is all provided through measurement. And so then we can actually get really, really on top of all of this and use quantified self devices. And on the left here is just an image from the, I believe the original Wired article on quantified self written by Kevin Kelly and uh, a guy who has become actually a good friend and mentor of mine, Gary Wolf. And we can use these quantified self devices to ramp up behavior change through feedback loops. Uh, we can use them to assess our day to day. And we can use things like the Aura Ring, you can use different activity trackers, et cetera, et cetera. And so what I want to do is take you guys through a case study. As I mentioned, uh, I'm working through, or I'm working predominantly with entrepreneurs who are changing the world and trying to optimize their health or uh, helping them optimize their health. I also tend to work with finance people because you can go back to my previous life and actually take a look at my TED talk, uh, but I did spend some time in the finance world. And so this case study is with an anonymous fund manager. I would love to give his name, but as you can imagine, a lot of people in the finance world don't like to have that much public information out there. But this fund manager uh, had issues with sleep, stress, and nutrition, as is very common with a lot of people in that industry. And you can imagine a work-life balance that is virtually non-existent. And especially when something like our current crisis comes up, things explode, his portfolio explodes, uh, and he's always on call. That can lead to states of insomnia, that can lead to states of not really feeling so well. And so the anonymous fund manager uh, who lives in London uh, came to me and said like, hey, what can we do? I wanna figure out how to live just more optimally because he could already see the path down the road. His boss had had a heart attack, et cetera, et cetera. And so what do we do? Um, this is a little bit of a deeper dive on the health optimization medicine practice formula. I, I run health optimization practice in Europe, uh, but this is a little bit of what I did with this particular fund manager. And so first things first, you have blood, urine, and stool tests delivered to their door. And what these allow us to do is to assess our, our different biomarkers at the level of the metabolome. Again, just recapping what the metabolome is, is just looking at our cells, both where they are today and where they were previously. And based on looking at things like the Krebs cycle, we're able to assess exactly what nutrients a person needs. And so when we got the results back, here's what that kind of looked like. And so what you can tell very quickly through this scorecard is that there are some supplementation needs. If you look at just sort of the things that are borderline or high need, vitamin C, alpha lipoic acid, manganese, and as well as the Bs, vitamin B deficiency, as Dr. Kanika probably knows very, very well, is common among very stressed people. And if you see high antioxidant needs, you may have an instance of heavy metal toxicities. And so we can take this information and now knowing this information, look at what supplements or what dietary interventions we can do.
obviously we love to all be able to take food that will complete our nutrient need. But in the case of the modern world, or depending on where you live, your soils may be stripped of the minerals that you need, and your food may not be necessarily can, containing the nutrients that you need. So in order to get those nutrients, in order to get that food, we may look at supplementation or, of course, lifestyle change. Now, we also look at the gut, and this is from a three-day stool test. And what you can see here is there is a bacterial infection, which has to be due with. There is a insufficient breakdown of protein products, which is interesting because if you think about you know, a person who's consuming quite a lot of protein with the idea of building muscle. Well, if you're not digesting it, if you're not getting those amino acids, well, maybe you're putting, leaving a lot of things on the table. And so we can look at things like digestive enzymes as a way of remedying this situation. And finally, we also look at food sensitivities. Now, food sensitivities are interesting in the sense that they are very controversial. Uh, however, in a clinical setting, we do know that they work. If you look at this particular person's food sensitivities, you can see very quickly that casein, which is milk fat, uh, but also milk are very severe, as in they should avoid them for a year. Eggs and egg yolks, and this person was taking those eggs uh, for five years every single day. And you can imagine that did develop a little bit of food sensitivity here. And what we can do is we can start to remove foods from the diet in a form of elimination with the hope of making and repairing that low-grade inflammation that's going on. And then once we've done that, we get enough information to build a playbook uh, for, for someone. And this playbook can look very much like an 8 to 15 page guide, depending on what you need. And that will go very, very detailed into you know, what exactly, uh, what supplements do you need, but also what lifestyle modifications can you have? For instance, if you have sleep issues, well, perhaps anchoring your circadian rhythms with something like sun every morning or trying to ensure that you're getting enough vitamin D is something that we can look to uh, add to your lifestyle. And that playbook allows you to go off and action things in your everyday life. But this is just part of the equation, right? So part of the equation allows us to, to give you a blueprint and a playbook, but let's talk about how we accelerate that behavior change. Because if I just gave you a playbook and had you walk away with it, the chances of you adhering to it over the course of the next couple of weeks may be pretty good. Couple of months, less so, a year or more, not as much. And so how do we get people who may be completely opposite of the behavior that they need to get to, uh, to change their behaviors as soon as possible? And this is where I love quantified self devices. As I mentioned, I, I am a quantified self geek. I've been speaking about Quantified Self for a very, very long time. I've been uh, at Quantified Self conferences, both speaking as well as you can check out that, that TED Talk where I do talk a little bit about Quantified Self as well. And Quantified Self, to me, is a great way of supporting behavior change. Yes, these devices vary in their accuracy, but if you look at the data as relative to you, you can start to very quickly associate behaviors with uh, the different effects that you may want or the different outcomes that you want, may want and the data that comes from quantified self devices. So let's take one case in point. If you struggle with sleep and you're willing to admit it, I want you to put a one in the chat right now because there are people out there and look, sleep is still my biggest opportunity. I think it's one of those things that I'll admit that over time, uh, I've done a lot in terms of improving, you know, when I was between the age of 18 and 30, I was sleeping four to six hours a night. Now I average a little bit over seven, but that is still the biggest opportunity for me to improve my health. But in the case of this person, that fund manager I was talking about, there's a few behaviors that we wanted to start to recognize, start to measure. And looking at those behaviors of one, being on your screen too late at night, and two, the amount of wine that you're consuming in the evening, allowed us to really just associate those behaviors with a improvement or significantly uh, worsen sleep. And so 
let's take for example that wine. In the case of this fund manager, they, you know, fund manager's life involves a lot of client entertainment. You have to in entertain investors, you have to entertain companies, et cetera, et cetera. And sometimes you get going out to these dinners and these dinners can be filled with wine. Now, if you have too much wine, if you are, be, are taking in too much wine and you have a quantified self device, you can start to associate that behavior, that drinking of wine with an increased or decreased sleep, sleep score. And so in the case of this person, they thought that drinking two to four glasses of wine was not really doing anything to their health. You give them an aura ring and all of a sudden they're tracking that two to four glasses of wine and realizing that's really not helping their deep and REM sleep. They're really not able to get as high quality of sleep. As a result, when I give them the recommendation of perhaps cutting down on the booze, perhaps drinking a little bit earlier in the evening rather than late in the evening, we can now associate that with data. And when we associate that with data, they get a feedback loop immediately the next morning. And when you tighten that feedback loop so that they have really data the next morning, it's very, very powerful in terms of being able to see somebody change very, very quickly. The next thing I want to talk about is continuous glucose measurement. So this fund manager uh, happens to enjoy a variety of foods and he was willing to try a 14 day continuous glucose measurement. If you've ever tried a continuous glucose measurement, please put a one in the chat right now. And, but coming back to our fund manager friend, right? So he was willing to put on the continuous glucose measurement for 14 days. Essentially what you do is you put it near your tricep, not quite on it. Um, and it's a pin and you're able to scan your, your blood glucose in some cases instantaneously, but in other cases it scans every 15 minutes. Um, he wore it while he was eating his food and he began to track his food and see what foods were, were serving him in terms of energy, but also taking away from energy. And if you think of a fund manager, their job is really to be on cognitively all the time. That requires a sufficient amount of energy and, and energy demand and focus. And so when you start looking at this in terms of food associations, you can see that white rice here in the middle. He took it for lunch and white rice caused his blood glucose to spike significantly. The gray column in the middle there is uh, exactly what happens to his blood glucose over the course of two hours afterwards. Now, that association is not necessarily true with all people, but within his case, he, his blood glucose raising resulted in an increase in distraction, a decrease in, uh, in energy post, and he really didn't feel good. Now, so what does the continuous glucose measurement allow us to do? It allows us to identify foods that we can remove or include in our diet because they give us energy or they take away from energy. Now, people use this in the case of diabetes, and I totally agree with that, but as a healthy person, you can use these tools to identify which foods serve you in terms of giving you that energy if cognition is your goal or if physical performance is your goal. And so what, did, what actually happened with this person? In the result, they got increased energy, they increased their sleep duration, which is pretty huge uh, considering you know, what uh, the average finance person that I know goes through. And they had a 50% reduction in what is called MSQ, or that's the Institute of Functional Medicine's uh, symptom questionnaire. And so that's a pretty, pretty powerful outcome by using just lab tools, behavior change, and accelerating that behavior change through the use of quantified self devices. And so I think just to recap a couple of the things that we've learned already, we've learned that how these lab tests can lead to assessment. We learned how they can lead to establishing your baseline or where you are at this moment. And we've also learned how we can use these tools to accelerate behavior change. In the case of the elimination diet, knowing what foods to eliminate. And that's very, very powerful to see that, right? It's also very, very powerful to know uh, what's going on with your blood glucose or what's going on with your sleep when it comes to devices like the Oura Ring. But I want to leave you guys with a few takeaways because we're all biohackers, right? And biohackers love, you know, takeaways, to do's, et cetera. And I see that that chat is blowing up and I want you guys to continue throwing chat in there 
but also the q and I want to hear what's going on or what questions that you have on these different devices. But in terms of takeaways uh, for today, I want to give you guys a couple of structures, a couple of markers, and a couple of experiments that you can run on yourself. So these are structures for self-experimentation because after all, this webinar is on measurement. And it's in part, I think of measurement as something that I can do by myself that doesn't necessarily have to cost very much. Uh, I want to give you three markers that are particularly important right now. And I want to look at five different experiments that you can run with yourself uh, starting today. And I'm going to throw a little bonus at the end here. Uh, but if you realize that this is a Fibonacci sequence, I want you to put a one in the chat. Uh, because the, the bonus at the end will complete that Fibonacci sequence a little bit as well. And so two structures for experiments. First one is pretty easy. And if you're a digital marketer, this is the pot most popular phrase in the world, right? A-B testing. We A-B test a lot of stuff in our businesses, uh, but what about A-B testing our life, our nutrition? Setting up an A-B test for yourself is quite easy. You make a modification in your life, you control for that modification and you switch it. And you notice the difference between before and after. This is very, very helpful when you have some sort of measurement. We'll talk about the tools that you use to measure here in a little bit. But tracking this stuff in the form of a spreadsheet is quite an easy way to do it. But A-B testing is, is simply, it requires collecting data before a control is made or an alteration is made and then you make an alteration. For example, you could be switching to a vegan diet very soon. Well, you have a control beforehand of what your current diet is, and you want to establish some variables about how you feel, how you're sleeping, what your weight is. Grab those variables or data points, if you will, and then make that modification. And so you make that modification for a vegan diet, and let's say it's for 30 days. At the end of those 30 days, you're going to say, okay, where's my weight? Where's my energy levels? Where are the different things that we've, that we've measured beforehand? And so you can A-B test for yourself quite easily using different, just simple switches in your life. The second experiment structure that I love personally is something called A-B-A testing. Now, A-B-A testing can be done in a number of different ways. But first, you want, to grow, you want to gather a robust data set at the beginning, uh, a data set that it just really is representative of where your current life is. That could be something like caffeine, for instance, whereby you, know, you have two to three cups a day. You can track things like subjective energy levels if you don't have a quantified self device. Otherwise, you can track things like sleep or steps or whatever it is. Then you make your switch. And let's say you drop coffee in this case, and you have zero coffee for a period of weeks. Now, what we're attempting to gather here is can you increase your caffeine sensitivity and go to less coffee in the future? And so when you switch back after that period of B to that period of A, when you reintroduce coffee, have you reintroduced that caffeine sensitivity? And this is a great structure when it comes to both caffeine and seeing if you can reintroduce caffeine sensitivity in your life, but also things like food sensitivities. If you think about foundationally what an elimination diet is, an elimination diet is removing a certain food, a certain nutrient for a period of time, but reintroducing it in the sense that you want to become less sensitive in the future. You have A, situation, where you're sensitive to a food, B, where you've removed the food for a period of time. In the case of that person that I mentioned earlier, for instance, eggs, they would remove them for a year. And then you reintroduce eggs a year later with the hope that you're not sensitive anymore. And so that is a classic ABA test. And so we have two structures. Now let's move on to those three markers. Given, uh, okay, Another question in the crowd is, how many of you aren't on lockdown right now? Do we have anybody here from Sweden? I would love to see if there's people from Sweden in the crowd. Uh, one of the reasons why I ask this is because if you're on lockdown because of what's going on globally, if you're in some sort of situation where you're shelter in place, 
three markers that I love to measure right now, uh, given this situation, are simply sleep and sleep duration. This is something you can track on a spreadsheet or an Aura Ring if you want. I have no affiliation with the company, so um, you can get that if you want. You can get other devices too. The important thing here is to just track it. Now, sleep is particularly important because it does have knock-on benefits to your immune system. The other thing that I love tracking right now is steps. If your shelter in place and your place is not very big, you may have to do a few laps around your place. Or if you live in London where you're allowed out only one or two times, or actually I think it's one time a day, perhaps you go out for a longer walk. And so tracking steps can ensure that we don't just sit around, watch Netflix, or perhaps my least favorite show of all time, Tiger King, all day long. And so tracking steps allows us to ensure that we're moving. And then another thing that's just simply easy because we're not moving or maybe we're not predisposed to move as much as we used to is weight. And so tracking your weight every day and just making sure that you don't put on that COVID-15 is a very good, uh, good marker to track at this time. Now markers, and I've got friends in the quantified self world that do this, you can get thousands of them, literally. You can be both subjective and objective, but these are just three markers that I think people can be tracking at this time. And then five experiments that I think are interesting to run for people. Uh, wine and what it does to your sleep. Now, you can start tracking this with a spreadsheet and just sort of say subjectively how you feel when you wake up. So you look at number of glasses of wine and subjectively how you feel when you wake up. Or if you had a, a quantified self device, whether that's your Garmin, your Aura Ring, whatever it is, uh, that could track both your sleep stages, but also your total sleep. And you can measure the effects of wine. And I just put wine here because alcohol had more text to it but you can use any form of alcohol in terms of just tracking your sleep and your sleep quality. The other one that you can start tracking is meditation and your subjective reaction to stress. And meditation changed my life in terms of how I react to people and how I'm able to really just pause before reacting in certain cases. And so one experiment that you could run is 20 minutes or 10 minutes of meditation every single day run that for a week and just start to really observe and write down because the variable you, you want to write down how you react to stress how stressed you are and you can see really start to track that data and start to maybe associate that those days where you meditate you handle stress a lot better one that i've been very very attentive to the past year is last meal time and sleep quality uh, Actually, it's been a couple years now, but without a quantified self device, I didn't actually know this, but my recovery is so much better when I have my last meal two to three hours before I go to bed. It's also that it's, I've noticed that I have an increase in deep sleep. Now, this not, may not be the case with you, but it's an experiment certainly wor worth running. Can you get better, higher quality sleep by reducing or uh, increasing, sorry, the space between your last meal and when you go to bed. Exercise time and energy. Uh, you know, it's interesting because people like JJ Virgin and myself also agree, you know, whenever you can get in exercise is a good time to exercise. But if you have multiple options there, it's probably best to look at something earlier in your day. And one of the reasons for this is how it impacts sleep, but also how it may impact your energy throughout the day. And so when you start to do this, maybe position your exercise time both in the afternoon, maybe at lunch if you're able to, or in the morning, and see which one helps you in terms of energy. I found personally that middle of the day exercise helps me avoid that afternoon lull and allows me to just take a brief break from my morning of deep work and then sail into the afternoon with a really just an amazing amount of energy. And then finally, the, the last experiment that we're going to have here is elimination diets. So take a food that you may recognize is doing something funky to your gut and take it out of your diet for four to six weeks, ideally six, and take it out and then see how you feel over the course of those six weeks. 
and you can A, B, A this and see if you've actually reduced the sensitivity of it by reintroducing it six weeks later. Those are five experiments. I promised you one last little bonus here to complete that Fibonacci sequence. We went from two to three to five to eight, and now eight tools that you can use to start your self-experimentation today. Um, half of these are free, I believe. And you can look at things like Google Sheets as just a way to do self-tracking. I still do quite a lot of self-tracking within a Google Sheet. Uh, you can get a scale for weight. You can get rescue time to track your time on your computer, especially now that a lot of us are home. It's nice to have something to track where we're spending our time. Uh, an Aura Ring is one of my favorite quantified self devices. Garmin is a great activity tracker. Moment, that flower there, is a great way to track screen time. And so when I know that I'm interacting too much with the matrix, I like to install something like Moment to make sure that I bring my screen time down or the number of times I access my phone. By just visually seeing how many times I access, access my phone, I'm able to thereby bring it to my awareness and then reduce it. So just by acknowledging that these exist, remember what gets measured gets managed, I'm able to reduce my behavior thereof. Meal trackers, I don't love them. Nobody really loves them, but chronometer is a, a good one to go to, especially when I'm switching my diet. And then blood glucose monitors, uh, you know, they're easy to get enough. And I think blood glucose is a marker that's certainly worth uh, people taking a look into. But my key takeaway from today, and I actually have no clue how long I've been speaking, but my key takeaway from today is just measure your ecosystem. Have a thought about what are the variables that could potentially be impacting you and causing you to not perform as well as you'd like in whatever endeavor of life. That could be something like air quality. That could be something like uh, movement, for instance, and start to measure it. And once you start to measure it, at least bringing it to your awareness will allow you to act on it. It'll allow you to establish goals and set benchmarks. And then you can use that data to serve as those feedback loops to increase that behavior change at an ever more rapid rate. So I believe that's it. You can find me at Decoding Superhuman everywhere on social media. The podcast is out there with 150 plus episodes, a lot of free content out there. And then um, for you guys who are interested, I have a, a new newsletter coming out and it's not on this page, but I wanted to just kind of shout it out to you guys. It's an application only thing. It's decoding superhuman.com slash the signal. We'll put it in the chat maybe. And the signal is my way of giving back to the community that I love, which is business owners, entrepreneurs, executives, etc but also health practitioners and really curating information for those people. And so if you go to decoding superhuman.com slash the signal, uh, there should be an application there for you. Uh, you can also check out things like the blue tongues at transcriptions.com. And if you're interested further in home hope, uh, the health optimization medicine and practice that is at homehope.org. Yulia, Mick, this has been amazing. Yeah, thank you thank guys you. for listening. Thank you. Yeah, uh, thank you, Boomer, for such a great presentation. Uh, thank you for this useful information, for your recommendations, what to measure and how to measure, and for recommendations of uh, quantified self devices. That was great. We already have around six uh, questions to you for in our um, Q and A uh, pool. I would like to ask these questions uh, after. Uh, for Svetoslav's presentation, because uh, after Svetoslav's presentation, uh, we will discuss all questions together uh, with you and Svetoslav. So Svetoslav, please now uh, show us your presentation and uh, give us your um, lecture, and uh, then we will, I will run a Q&A session. Lecture today will uh, about biohacking, about what we talked today, have been talking today, how to manage and how to measure your health as a project. So uh, a few words about myself. As I mentioned, I'm a medical doctor and biohacker for myself. The, what I like in biohacking the most in management of health that um, probably you, 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 a lot of times you, you, you met doctors who 
didn't uh, took their own uh, prescription for themselves. So you cannot do biohacking if you don't do biohacking for yourself. So that's the principal uh, difference between classic healthcare or for today's, for today it's uh, disease care and uh, biohacking. So I have been uh, studying and um, practicing medicine, healthcare uh, all my life. But uh, four years ago, after I launched the first biohacking clinic in uh, Eastern Europe, I started to check uh, all uh, health measuring and health management technology but for by myself. And uh, this, uh, during all this time, I, I'm tracking over 2000 parameters of my health. And these data all are protocolized and I reach uh, each year 15, 20% positive dynamic. Uh, at the same time, I'm entrepreneur and health management is very close to business, to entrepreneurship. When you manage your resources, you are, or you reach your goals or you don't reach, you, or you're effective or you're profitable or you're not. The same in health management. So if you do correct things, if you have enough, enough information, if you have enough dat data, if you have enough analytics, if you take uh, correct manage management uh, decisions, you reach good results. And in biohacking, you never have, uh, as in business, you never have a magic pill or magic test. You have to work, work uh, being concentrated and uh, uh, being ambitious to reach your goals. So uh, I, we, we ran the first biohacking clinic in Eastern Europe and also we, ran, uh, we, we run um, educational platform Biohacking Fest Ukraine. I used to, we, we, to do lectures in international biohacking uh, events with Boomer as well. And uh, also uh, write, uh, I used to write a lot of uh, articles and make a lot of interviews about biohacking. So this is an uh, illustration of my own uh, way of transformation of myself. As you see, biohacking, it's not on, always uh, um, victories. You can make things very bad, then a bit better, then bad again, and then better. So the, the most important thing in biohacking is that you have to understand when, where you are and where you want to be and what you have to do and what you, are, you, you can do or, or you cannot. Then let's talk about biohacking because measuring and managing health is biohacking. So if you check, uh, the, one of the biggest problems for today for biohacking is that if you will start to check in Google what is biohacking, you will be probably confused because there is a, a lot of, lot of very controversial information. And I think for, that for, for the moment, a very important uh, step for biohackers all over the world to make more clear understanding among ourselves what is biohacking because other people who doesn't want biohacking uh, to spread to develop for people's health because what is biohacking by hacking is taking responsibility for your own health because you cannot manage if you don't care you, you will not measure your health if you don't care and uh, for example such signals which appears uh, google doesn't allow to uh, last f three or four months doesn't has to uh, doesn't allow to promote biohacking uh, offers the word biohacking you cannot uh, uh, promote in in google or you cannot promote stem cells you cannot promote uh, 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 neurofeedback so what does it mean it means that environment is not really um, friendly for biohacking because biohacking make people free free of uh, lobby free of influence free of manipulation when people get uh, their uh, the, the responsibility on the, on themselves for their uh, primary resource they become free and not everybody wants it so biohacking uh, is something related to health yes bio and hacking has two meanings unauthorized access to data breaking of IT code or improvement of code for better IT performance so in my opinion biohacking is a measurable health project management for higher performance in all areas of life 
but the main question why why should we manage our health by managing uh, your health as a project you can reach very very uh, wide range of uh, results starting from uh, curing of diseases which you are suffering from uh, up to making your life more quality and, and, and longer and making reaching better performance in all, all areas of your life, in business, in relationship, in, in, in social connections, in uh, politics, in sport, anyway. But very important for us to understand when we, when we talk about management of health is what is health? Uh, according to this determination of World Health Organization, health is a state of complete physical, mental, and social well-being and not merely the absence of disease or infirmity. So, but uh, there is a problem with this uh, determination because, uh, because it was uh, developed in uh, almost 60 or even 70 years ago, uh, years ago. And for today we have already uh, implemented 11th version of uh, classification of diseases and we cannot uh, make uh, um, different uh, meanings that health is absence of, of diseases because classification of diseases includes even wrinkles for today. Everybody has wrinkles, so everybody has uh, diseases, so nobody has health. So we don't have to made, uh, make uh, health contra uh, diseases because everybody has diseases, but in the same time, when we have diseases, our uh, health doesn't disappear. This is very important. And uh, word complete is... Uh, Create, uh, creates a problem because whoever seen uh, complete well-being, physical or mental or something, there, is, there are some, always some violations and we have just to, to treat them. So I suggest the determination of health is that this is a state of measurable well-being of body, mind, spirit, social connection is, and environment. We reached this determination during long practice uh, collecting a uh, huge amount of data as for, for ourselves, as for other people, and understanding that in our bodies, everything is very interconnected. Our internal organs interconnected very much with our uh, rational uh, mental part. Our uh, rational mental part is very uh, connected to our, um, to our um, uh, spiritual part. We all people are interconnected and influence each other, and we are all part of environment. We not only um, consume uh, environment, we also t put our input. So this is a uh, determination of health in our opinion. How it works? How it works biohacking in our clinic? So first, we make uh, we collect data above uh, 2,000 parameters based on um, questionnaires, physical examination, lab tests, and instrumental tests. Uh, the collection of data takes a uh, whole day, and then we proceed it uh, half autom automatically um, during two, three weeks, and then you get a presentation, not only the line with diagnosis, when we, you see uh, the smallest violations of your health based on six, uh, based on the nine blocks, which I will now uh, describe you more detailly. Genetics, molecular health, cellular health, all internal organ, organs, and set, et cetera. Then, based on your unique picture of your health, we help you to develop uh, your measurable, smart goals uh, for your health in, for three months. Three months is the first... Uh, uh, period of time when you can reach very good uh, and sustainable results. The less time is not enough, but more is uh, uh, parameters can change. And then uh, you, uh, after you implement the program, which we help you to develop, it includes um, a lifestyle habits, uh, improvement uh, protocol uh, treatment and additional diagnostic and health improvement medical procedures. Then we help to implement this program and in three months we help to make a uh, checkup to, object to make uh, this result objective. So in my opinion, true biohacking, if you have enough, enough data, so it's not uh, uh, enough to measure only small uh, uh, number of parameters each day. Um, imagine that management of your health is like a, 
management of your company, of your, of your business. Are there uh, entrepreneurs today among our auditory guys? Do you work um, for companies or you make your own business? Please make uh, put notes uh, if you are entrepreneurs, so you will be better to understand. So uh, you need to have um, uh, year, uh, yearly analysis, qu quarter analysis, for, for better management decision. You always have to put goals. Your, your health uh, consists of, um, un, I think, unlimited number of parameters. You cannot track and manage all of them. But you can always uh, check the more and more of them. Uh, in our clinic, for example, we, in my opinion, we, we make it the, the biggest, uh, we manage and track the, the biggest amount of uh, parameters of health. But even the number of parameters that we track, it's not all health parameters. But um, you have to manage those parameters that you can influence and which you understand the connection between, between, between of them. Because very uh, rare in, uh, in uh, health, you, there is a button turn on or turn off. For example, if you have deficiency of vitamin D, you can uh, take um, uh, supplement vitamin D. But for example, for cholesterol, uh, there is uh, direct medicine, statins, but statins have a lot of um, side effects. And if you want only to manage cholesterol level, you may take uh, statin. But if you want to uh, manage ho whole health, the statins is not the best uh, option to reduce cholesterol. I will describe the, the mechanism, how cholesterol uh, appears. Then when you have enough data, you have to put goals, not like in uh, disease management, first diagnosis, then you have treatment and nobody knows which results we will reach and when. Uh, always put goals based on parameters you track. This is very important because it motivates you to reach uh, them. Then you, have, you need to have plan. Plan which includes synergy of different uh, health improvement methods because there is no and there will no, not, never will be um, magic pills or magic in injections or magic vaccine which will improve all parameters of health. There is, you, to, to reach good results, you always have to, um, to, to, uh, to connect different, uh, different ways. First of all, uh, daily habits, nutrition, water, physical activity, meditations, uh, intoxications, to reduce intoxications, alcohol, for example, uh, protocol treatment and um, uh, medical, medical health improvement uh, procedures. And you have to check results. Not every, only every day, but at least each three months, you have to understand which goals did you, have you put and which result have you reached. So now I will describe you nine uh, blocks of uh, uh, parameters of health which we track. And I will uh, describe you how to improve them, what, what data can you get from it, and how can you influence. So genetics. Uh, the simplest method to understand your uh, predictions to different diseases is to ask, to your, you ask your parents uh, which diseases had your relatives, your grandfathers, grand, grandmothers. And then if you will see that some diseases, they repeat for, from both sides, it, it means that probably you have high prediction to these diseases. In this uh, uh, level, so you cannot get any more information. For, for more information, you need to have tests. T genetic tests today, are, they are very simple and very cheap. So um, based on genetics tests, you can know your um, biological age uh, based on um, measurement of your telomeres length. Uh, you can check your prediction to different kinds of uh, metabolism disorders, and you can check your prediction to a range of uh, 30 uh, diseases. And uh, you can, uh, the, the, the telomere length is the only genetic test which can be uh, changed. You, the, 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 the telomere can become uh, shorter or it can become longer. All other genetic tests you can uh, do once a year and that's uh, enough. Uh, no, not what, once a year, once in your life. They don't change. Then you have to understand that our health, it's, 
in the molecular level is the balance of uh, antioxidants and free radicals. Free radicals, it's aggressive atoms or molecules with deficit of electron on, on its orbits and they attack normal uh, molecules, especially it's important for uh, cell membranes. If they attack them, if they broke, break them, the, is the sa uh, almost the same mechanism as virus acts. It's, it also gets in, uh, through the membrane and destroys uh, cell. The same mechanism of free radical. They take electron from the orbit of uh, normal molecules and atoms from uh, cell. They break membrane and they destroy cell and um, the parts of cell, they also become free radicals and the chain reaction goes on, uh, leads to cellular inflammation. Maybe you heard that inflammation, it's uh, part of uh, aging uh, uh, chain and uh, the, the inflammation, it's not only if it's visu visu visualized in uh, ultrasound or if it's, it, it pains. Um, inflammation is uh, the chronic process which different level uh, take part in all, all the time in our uh, body and we ca can and have to manage it as well. How can we manage oxidative stress? By uh, antioxidants. We have internal antioxidant system, but not so uh, good as, uh, for example, dogs, dogs have. Uh, for example, in livers of dogs, they pr can produce vitamin C, asc ascorbic acid. We can, uh, humans cannot do it. So we have to take uh, with our uh, food uh, enough uh, uh, of antioxidants and with supplements and with intravenous uh, as well. For today, it's the 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 most the highest um, biological acceptability of uh, the chemicals is intravenous uh, implementation. So reduce your um, your oxidative stress, the consumption of free radicals from outside. You can also produce free radicals by a violation of uh, different functions of your organ. The fir first of all, nutrition. For example, if you get good products inside, but you cannot digest them well, uh, they uh, turn on into free radicals already inside of your body. Then uh, help all your organs to work well, uh, to not to increase, um, not to increase internal. Uh, oxidant stress and uh, take enough of antioxidant from outside by food, by supplements and intravenously. Then cellular health. Uh, cellular health is uh, due to our ability of our mitochondria to produce enough of ATP energy by oxidating of glucose. In this uh, photo you can see erythrocytes, <clears throat> the, the red blood test that have to transport oxygen to the, the, the forest uh, cells of our body. But if they, for example, stick, like in this picture, they cannot get into small uh, vessels. And after the, the diameter of these small vessels, um, uh, oxidation of glucose cannot, uh, is not able to take part because th there is no um, excess of oxygen. So glucose, the, the less effective uh, method of ATP energy production turns on and it provokes um, acidose because when uh, uh, when um, gluco uh, glycolysis take place uh, the, the less ATP energy pro produces and um, uh, lactic acid produces and uh, provokes uh, bigger uh, sticks of uh, erythrocytes and uh, so any kind of um, uh, intoxication stress, uh, bad nutrition, uh, less uh, water provoke a, a bigger sticking of this erythrocyte. And we notice in our practice that mental uh, exercises such as transcendental meditation or neurofeedback, they help very quickly to improve this by, uh, blood picture. So it, it shows how our mental health and internal health uh, connected. Then functional health, your body shape, your body structure, it's not only um, it's not only a uh, point of uh, beauty or being attractive, it's part of your health. So the less volumes you have in your stomach zone, the less volumes you have in your neck zone, the better. The more volumes you have in your hips as a, a, a muscle, mus I mean muscles, of course not fat, as for men, as for women, the better. For your hormonal 
health, especially for your sexual health. Body strength and uh, time uh, during which your pulse get uh, norm normal after physical activity is also important uh, part of different kind of uh, sport diagnostic uh, or VO2 um, test. Then internal organs, very lot of tests, very lot of information. In the very end of my lecture, I will give you 10 simplest blood tests that you have to track, at least them you have to track, they're uh, the better. But uh, you have to understand that your health is not on only blood tests. Uh, your health is the complex well-being of your body, mind, uh, spirit, social connection, and uh, environment. But at least uh, uh, the, the the information that you can get from from lab tests, from from claims, from uh, uh, with, with uh, in cooperation with with your doctor. By the way, the best. Um, specialization of doctor that you have to find uh, to manage your health is a family doctor because family medicine family doctor is the only specialization that which um, helps maintain people independently on diagnosis continuously uh, the, the family doctor is the only specialist which uh, guide person continuously independently of uh, absence or present of disease gender or age that's why uh, and but but the problem is that not all, every uh, not each family doctor they used to think uh, by categories of health management of prevention and so on. You have to find such uh, family doctor. But family medicine is the best um, the best uh, specialization for biohacking. So in internal organs, you have to pay attention first of all to nutrition. Uh, you can eat the best product, but if you don't. Uh, uh, don't uh, able to uh, split uh, proteins into amino acids by enzymes, uh, they will appear into toxins. They will turn on into toxins. Um, and if there will be problems with, with gut, with, there, there is no, no ability to build their um, good microbiome. Uh, if um, a barrier function of gut will, be, uh, will suffer, the toxin will get inside of, into blood and the liver start to suffer. And liver is the one of the most important organs uh, responsible for metabolism. That's why please uh, always pay attention and support your nutritional system, your liver, support your uh, uh, cardiovascular system, your neural system as central as uh, peripheric and check um, a picture of your mucosis and uh, skin of internal uh, uh, of external ear the how it, they are inflamed it is the picture of how your local immunity works if your um, mucosis of nose or throat they're always inflamed even contacting the uh, not very pathogenic uh, microflora it means that uh, immunity level is very low and if you will see, if you will improve your sleep, your, your digestion, your water balance, your meditation, your mucosis and, uh, will um, become more calm, even if uh, uh, micro, microbiome around us will not uh, be different. So please track uh, your parameters of your new neural system, your ear, nose, throat system, um, vision system of vision because when you check your your eyes you check not only how you see you check only your small vessels you check your nerves please check your respiratory system digital uh, digestive system uh, respiratory system cardiovascular system urinary system uh, system of uh, andrological gynecological uh, system um, uh, women and andrological system men and pay attention to your uh, skeletal muscular system because uh, internal organs, they are connected with muscles and muscles, they, their status influence into internal organs and internal organs influence uh, uh, muscles. For example, problems with digestion can uh, provoke uh, uh, backache. A lot of people suffer from it. And if you will improve your digestion, you will reduce inflammation of gut it will reduce um, uh, pain in uh, lower part of back. 
then your your skin it's not only your appearance your skin can show you very lot of information for example in this picture you can see the signs of the hydration you can see the signs of uh, liver problems um, for example herpes everybody every people has herpes, herpes virus inside but not everybody has some external manifestation on skin some people has herpes on lips some some people has herpes on uh, um, uh, organs uh, se sexual organs and uh, some people has even uh, infection of mononucleosis when uh, immune system works not so well and uh, herpes virus can um, destroy liver and uh, skin can help uh, uh, to check the primary uh, violation of, of health uh, of organs of the nutritional system of uh, um, urinary system but also improving of internal health can help uh, to improve your appearance then healthy habits the strongest uh, method of influence uh, please believe me my friends if i would know uh, the magic pills. We we, we use all uh, the, the the most uh, new the use the strongest methods even stem cells. We use them a lot, but there is no so um, powerful health improvement methods as daily habits. For example, the biggest one is to remove totally alcohol from your life, because health is a balance of intoxication and uh, ability to detoxify. And if you will re remove from your life for 100% alcohol, you will see uh, how uh, good results you will have. Uh, in the same time, smoking and alcohol in our stereotypes, it seems like this is the same uh, harm, but alcohol is much more harmful than, than smoking. Uh, smoking, of course, is also uh, harmful, but not so, as, uh, not so, so much as uh, alcohol. Then water, drink, uh, half a liter when you wake up and then uh, drink um, 40 milliliters f uh, f per kilogram of your weight body mass during the day for example if you're man uh, eat 80 kilograms uh, you have to drink uh, 3.2 liters per day and uh, uh, homogeneously whole day uh, and 80 percent have been drank uh, during six or uh, during 4 p.m don't drink too much uh, before sleeping then uh, nutrition healthy nutrition now we have a lot of information uh, um, fasting inter intermittent fasting keto diet please implement into your into your um, diet mediterranean diet what it means 70 percent uh, vegetables uh, good fats uh, good protein uh, and uh, eat first uh, salad, then eat um, uh, carb uh, uh, meat, or 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 if you if you vegan uh, uh, beans, and uh, if you like sweets, please eat uh, not uh, purified uh, sugars, uh, and uh, don't um, uh, use uh, sweets instead of food. Eat uh, sweets, uh, fruits, uh, nuts. And dry fruits uh, as a third, as a dessert after starter salad, uh, main course, and then um, then uh, dessert. And after you will implement it as a habit, you can start to use intermittent fasting, keto diet, uh, longer fasting. For example, I used to fast uh, five days maximum. Uh, so it's very good um, method. But the most important, always come back to Mediterranean diet. Not to forget about it. It's very. Uh, it's like a fundam fundamental. Then uh, sleeping. Sleeping is very important. Uh, you have to sleep enough. You have to sleep quality. The earlier you will get sleep, the better. If you have a, a possibility to take sleep uh, during day, small uh, day sleep, do it as well. And for, for, for now, for quarantine, it's a, the best time to get sleep enough. Sleep as much as you can. Uh, then, uh, uh, psycho-emotional balance. Meditate. Transcendental meditation. David Lynch, David Lynch Foundation is the best uh, practice. Uh, I mean, the best um, um, proceeded. Because uh, the David Lynch Foundation, uh, by the way, with Julia, we uh, connected to, through this organization. 
it uh, helps and spread this technology around the world and it's already have evidence-based uh, proofs. Uh, what is very important that you don't have to just practice it. You have to learn from teacher first in order to create correct uh, attitude toward what you will do and why you will do it. So it's not just you have, you can check in, uh, in uh, YouTube and then just repeat. The transcendental meditation is very simple but you have to, to, to develop a correct attitude toward it. And of course, physical activity. You, you need to have enough cardio, uh, strength, um, um, exercises, uh, stretching, and coordination. The, the, the ideal uh, co combination in, is when, when you have all four, but at least uh, uh, five, 10 minutes uh, morning exercises, but each day, it's uh, good, fundamental for, for your health. Then mental health, you have to understand that each your thought, each your emotion, it's like a medicine, it's like drug, and it can be or uh, harmful or uh, as a medicine, it can be uh, useful. And um, imagine you take for, as, as a supplement, for example, five, 10 pills per day, and you think uh, hundreds of thousand thoughts each day or even millions. And each of your thought, if each your emotion, it's or good or bad uh, medicine for you. So meditate, uh, sleep well, uh, do neurofeedback. feedback. Then goals and targets. It's very important for you to understand whom you are and whom you want to be. Not what environment you want to have, but how, who you are for the moment, for better understanding who you are, you will better understand how, which kind of person you want to be. There's a particular parameter. So, take goals, uh, they have to be real, they don't have to be false because uh, for, for the moment in our materialistic world, we have very lot of uh, pressure which uh, for media, which start to create stereotypes that we have to be rich, we have to be famous and uh, not always people, it's uh, the real goal of, of, of person. So you have to understand better yourself to better understand what you really want in future, what kind of person you want to be, how you want to develop. So which stereotypes we have to hack the first? That health is not opposite to diseases. Health doesn't disappear when you have disease. Everybody has diseases. But health is a manageable and measurable well-being of whole body, mind, spirit, social connections, and environment. You always will have some violation. It's normal. It's part of our nature. We will always have some simple or maybe not so simple disease, but it doesn't have to mean that we have to focus on our diseases and forget about health. We always have to manage health and we can always reach very good results. We have the youngest uh, patients in our clinic, 19 years, uh, years old and the, the um, oldest 83 years old. You can manage, start managing your health in any conditions for the best, for the worst. Uh, it, it's a kind of uh, responsible attitude you, st you have to act all, all the time. Then, health is not only lab tests and medicines, not only drugs. This is stereotype that uh, manufacturers of lab tests, of equipment, of, and of pharmaceuticals try to, to create. But we have to understand that our health is a well-being, complex well-being. Lifestyle is very important. Our mental health is very important. Our attitude is very important. Our social connection is very important. How we how we consume and how we influence uh, environment, very important. So health is not only not to suffer, health is for better living, for better or longer living. Not to, to die, not to suffer, but to, uh, to, to, to fulfill each day, but by the big amount of victories in all areas of life. That's why we need, that's what we, why we need our health, it's energy. And please remember that health is not only about body, it's about whole body, mind, spirit, social connection, and whole environment. We are part of, of nature and we are part, part of our uh, community. And for in the very end, please make photo of this slide. This is the list of uh, the simplest uh, uh, blood test that you have to track. So lipidogram, it means uh, different kind of cholesterol. And uh, cholesterol, you have to understand that this is... Uh, symptom it's not the reason after decompensating stress and uh, it, it, it leads to um, cellular uh, inflammation and it provokes uh, defects of internal walls of arterias and 
organism brain signals to liver to in, 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 increase level of cholesterol to fulfill this defect or by cholesterol or by trump so uh, this is like compensative reaction it's not the problem as itself it's something symptom how our organism try to adopt but you have to uh, check a lipidogram to understand the level of uh, how high this uh, level of defects of internal walls of arteries then glycated hemoglobin it uh, indicator of uh, uh, diabetes uh, or especially diabetes type 2 because uh, for one case of diabetes type 1 there are nine cases of diabetes type 2 and this uh, parameter can uh, can show you the the long term level of your glucose for example you can check glucose for the moment it will be low but if uh, glycated hemoglobin will be high it means that in average your glucose higher uh, than normal the third um, panel of uh, thyroid hormone check because uh, thyroid hormones they uh, help to understand uh, how your metabolism uh, does it work correctly or it's uh, um, decreased or uh, or increased uh, above norm uh, markers of viral hepatitis index homa homa is also uh, uh, markers of diabetes psa test uh, prostate spe prostate specific antigen for, antigen for men and pap test for women vitamin in the same time hormone d so uh, vitamin d it's not uh, um, uh, like vitamin like c like antioxidant it's more like hormone so we have to check it we have to improve the level ferritin uh, our ability to transport uh, oxygen so if ferritin is decreased we have to improve it uh, and to uh, the, the all these tests uh, from one to eight is blood and nine and uh, ten is fetuses so check uh, the hidden blood in fetuses and the uh, metabolic pro products of uh, helicobacter pylori it's a bacteria which causes ulcer so for for the for, for the moment for today uh, this is the information what i wanted you to provide it will be will be uh, appreciate to answer your questions thank you uh, so dear guests uh, let's remind that uh, here is our webinar on topic measurement and managing health and uh, let's remind that uh, we think that health is our prime and the most important uh, resource to build all aspects of our life so how fasting affects sleeping uh, best tips to deeper sleep and or best apps uh, to track sleeping please tell us about this sure uh, Svatislav, is it okay if I start and then you chime in? Yes, sure, Boomer. Welcome. Okay, cool. So um, just to give you guys some background on myself, right? So I mentioned very briefly earlier, I, I spent the age of 18 to 30 convincing myself that sleep was the cousin of death and I didn't need it, right? Um, <clears throat> that didn't result very well. And as a result, you can say I've learned a lot better. I've learned a lot more of, about sleep and chronobiology as a result. <clears throat> so let's take a, a couple of these questions in turn in terms of both what some of the literature says, but also um, what I have from personal experience. So how does fasting affect sleep? Um, my experience with clients as well as myself is that it depends. Uh, of course, I hate that answer as a person seeking truth all the time, but uh, it, it does depend. So if you're using fasting as a part of a time-restricted feeding plan and you're not shoving a thousand calories down your mouth right before you go to bed, there is potential that you have a sufficient regulation of blood glucose um, in order to achieve better sleep. Now, there is a danger in a lot of people that particularly when they first start fasting, that they'll do something like a 16-8 structure or whatever it is, and their body hasn't fully adapted to fasting. And then in the back end of their day, they all of a sudden get this surge in ghrelin, or, uh, which is your hung one of your hunger hormones, and they'll require themselves to eat a ton of calories. Now, that can ha have a net negative effect on sleep, but 
the literature suggests uh, early time restricted feeding is very beneficial uh, for sleep. I don't necessarily love that study because the control had people with their last meal at either three, I think it was like 3 p.m., uh, which is quite early and not so social. Uh, so on the fasting side of things, I'll, I'll turn it over to Slava and maybe we'll just take these one at a time. But any input, Slava? Uh, about fa uh, fasting, um, we have to understand that uh, what we do physically, we also have to understand what attitude we have toward that. Because if we fast and do it like a violence over ourselves, it's one result. If we already implemented all uh, basic things of biohacking in our, into our life and reach organically, evolutionary to different kind of fasting, it's, and we treat it as uh, care over ourselves, it's absolutely different result. In this case, of course, fasting will be very good for sleeping because fasting increases, uh, decreases inflammation and uh, decreasing stress, decrease, improving uh, different kind of uh, process of our uh, health. But if we are not ready to, fat, to fast, if we are in stress, uh, restricting our uh, nutrition, it would be absolutely different. It will, of course, harm sleeping. So in this uh, particular case, my recommendation, please always remember that all that you do physically it's not everything please always uh, add uh, your mental attitude to what what you are doing why you are doing it which parameters you 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 you, are, you want to change how you want to change uh, change them and uh, how long you have uh, how you can um, you are ready to to go far in it because uh, in health management you you can never uh, do something or reach some good results in one day. It's always a uh, cum cumulative effect. So mm -hmm. as answering your, your, uh, your question, if you are uh, doing fasting as uh, taking care over yourself without violence over yourself, it will improve your sleeping. If you are not ready to fast and you make it like force yourself to it, it will harm. And so, Yulia, if it's okay with you, we'll just jump into the next question about um, Camilla. Thank you for your question, and you know, uh, just to give some context here. So, the question itself is: What are the top tips or maximum two things you would do for deeper sleep? Um, I'm not going to include supplements or potential uh, exogenous substances in this. Uh, I think for me, uh, one of the ones that I introduced earlier in my presentation was the idea of not having a last meal too close to bed. That uh, has been very effective for me in terms of keeping it two to three hours before bed uh, in terms of deep sleep. Uh, the other thing, which you saw me put these on briefly, and this is actually going to become a little bit more of importance in the European summer, is light regulation. And I guess that's so broad, so let me break it down into just kind of two finer points. Uh, getting sun first thing in the morning to the extent you can, particularly on your face, to synchronize your circadian rhythms, as I know, Camilla, you know, uh, but also regulating light late at night so that you're not getting too much blue light. Uh, this is particularly an issue with the population that I serve, uh, whereby these guys are on their emails all the time. And so there are different blue light blocking devices, blue light blocking glasses, ones that I have right here that you can use. Um, and that becomes very, very important. Well, all the time, but during summer as well. Uh, Svatoslav, anything you'd like to add? Yes, thank, uh, thank you, Bo Boomer. Uh, in my opinion, uh, you start to build uh, your next uh, night quality of sleeping during the previous night. So the better you slept the previous night, the better you drank water, the better you um, uh, ate, the, the better you do ex did exercises, meditation, the better will be quality of your sleep. The simplest rules of good sleeping, the earlier you will get uh, sleep, the better. But 
if last night you got sleep at 2 a.m. and woke up at 2 p.m., you will not be able to get sleep at 10 p.m. So please remember that this particular night that you want to, to, to sleep well, you start to build this success story, let's say it like this, at least uh, 24 hours back. And the, le the less will be intoxications, the less, the better will be restoration during the day. The better will be your understanding that sleeping is a very important phase of your uh, restoration of your central neural system. But also you have to remember that during sleeping, uh, a very important um, detoxification process turns on and um, synthetic process, anabolic processes to build uh, necessary molecules of our uh, body, they also turn on. So the top three tips, uh, water, nutrition, physical activity, meditation, and good, uh, correct attitude towards uh, sleeping. You have to try. If you will not be able uh, to sleep well this night, try next, uh, uh, next night. Start to build your good sleeping whole day before. That's probably what I wanted to say. So as far as I understand, uh, to sleep well, you have uh, to have good performance uh, during the day. Yeah, <laughs> then you will sleep. <laughs> uh, yeah, thank you. And uh, question, one more question around sleeping. Uh, which uh, apps uh, do you recommend to, to track? Mm -hmm. um, so. Sure. Yeah, I guess it depends on uh, the wide range of money you want to spend, right? And so uh, my my personal favorite is the app that comes with the Aura Ring because it it's really dialed into certain factors that I care about, uh, particularly resting heart rate for me. Uh, but that's just one marker in the context of whole, and it gives you a bunch of markers which I enjoy. Now, there are um, other things out there like Sleep Tracker, I believe is an app, um, or Sleep Cycle, excuse me, is an app that is okay. Uh, the one thing I don't love about it, and I think they've fixed this somehow, is uh, putting yourself up by your bed late at night uh, is not my favorite thing. That's, I think, free or relatively cheap. Otherwise, you know, just a simple spreadsheet is a great way to start, right? If you are just sitting here and just getting into this stuff, uh, getting a spreadsheet and just tracking, you know, when you went to bed, when you woke up, how you subjectively feel in the morning, and just starting to associate behavior change is a great way to start. Well, yeah, I, it just was my question. So mm -hmm. I use Pillow, for example, and uh, uh, how it tracks, uh, it's used like Apple Watch that they I have to wear it uh, at night if I want to track uh, the sleep at night because, and again, Apple Watch is pretty bad on tracking sleep. So Aura Ring is uh, the best probably. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, they track it with uh, audio. So they record some audio of me making some sounds during the sleep, I guess, and analyzing it with their AI. So uh, I'm not sure like if it's right way. So the best way yeah. probably will be some physical like heart rate to analyze, not the audio. Yeah, and just- Nick, I am sleeping, I am sleeping during the night. I, I guess you are walking around. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, I'm, I'm the walker before the sleep. Uh, I have to walk like a couple miles just ah. to make my 10,000 steps every day. <laughs> there you go. Yeah, good. So Svetoslav, do you recommend uh, some uh, devices? I know you recommend Aura Ring as well, yes, and yes, maybe yes. something else. Yeah, it's very informative, and uh, I think that that your what you pay attention, what you pay money, what you pay uh, time for, it describes your attitude. What is valuable for you for you, and what is not? What is high priority? What is less priority? So I would not. Uh, uh, put a question like this that how how much money because uh, 300 euros I think everybody for the moment we spend such amount of money during during the months but in what exactly we, we can spend it so ask yourself uh, the, the, this question 
And uh, of course, uh, uh, making simple diary uh, to check not to get sleep uh, later than 10 p.m. or 11 p.m. is the simplest, uh, uh, simplest uh, version. But over, I think it's a good decision. For example, you you can you you guys you have to uh, you have to remember that you are lucky because for example in ukraine we have uh, uh, really try hard to get this aura ring in all countries that you can just order them and get uh, i i had to pay a lot of attention to get this ring so it's what what was more more than 3000 euros and of course yes thank you thank you boomer meditation meditation but regular meditation if you will make just one this particular meditation before sleeping probably it will not help a lot but if you will keep meditating two times a day in the morning and in the evening then day by day but what will help you to do it priority of your health paying attention paying time even without money but paying time and paying attention each day and for how long uh, for how long uh, no, no. If we're talking about uh, uh, ah, time. Med med meditation, yeah, it's uh, two time, uh, 20 time uh, per day. But, uh, yeah, two time, minutes. 20, 20 minutes. 20 minutes. Yeah, yeah, per, per day. But uh, first you have to make uh, training with physical uh, teacher because mm -hmm. this is the part of technology. Uh, and then you, I think you will, you will uh, see the first results as uh, with physical exercises in two, three weeks. Okay, coming to next okay. question. I think we're yeah, coming next to the question. Top of the I think I guess this question to Boomer because this question um, we have for in chat uh, in Boomer's presentation. So, which company device for CGM are you using, Boomer? It's question to you. I guess. Sure. There's there's really two out there that I think are pretty good. Um, the Dexcom and the Freestyle Libra. I prefer the Dexcom a little bit more just because of the frequency of data that you get, uh, but it is a little bit more expensive. Both are very good. What I love about CGM is that this is the first of this type of technology of continuous glucose measurement. Think about it in terms of continuous glucose, or sorry, ketone measurement in the future, uh, but also other markers as well. So this is just a very promising technology, and if you want to explore it, it's a lot easier to explore by yourself when you live in Europe. In the U.S., you do need a doctor's prescription. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And uh, okay, thank you. Next question: What do you recommend uh, uh, as uh, far as collection of bottling data before their intervention change? Uh, how long is acceptable? So I also think yeah, to both speakers. Yeah. Um, so it depends on really what your intervention is and how long your intervention is for but let's say take for example your diet if your diet's been regular for six months or something like that uh, the baseline data that you probably need on diet is going to be a handful of days maybe a week uh, but if you've had some recent variability or if you want something like trend data with your um, wearable device perhaps a month before uh, an intervention is a good idea um, and then you ideally want a, an intervention period that is substantial, uh, that you can collect data that won't just necessarily uh, show point in time. So for instance, one day interventions, I don't really love the idea of that. Uh, Would you please re repeat question? Uh, do you see in uh, Q&A? Just open sure. Q&A, uh, this is uh, on the top. Dr. Kaneko, I can, I can ask the question of you. Looking at uh, collecting data uh, and then with the idea of making an intervention and measuring it, how long would you want somebody to collect baseline data, i.e. what they're doing before, before they made an intervention? Uh, if I understood correctly, I would just say how I do this. <clears throat> mm -hmm. I collect uh, each, uh, how I recommend to do it to our clients. I collect uh, one, t uh, one time per year over 2,000 parameters of my health. Uh, then uh, I make uh, programs with my doctor. I'm doctor, uh, I, like chief medical officer, but in the same time, I'm in role of patient. And uh, my doctor 
who is my employee in the same time they they developed for me and I supervise it in the same time as chief medical officer. So we, we develop a personal health improvement program, improvement program uh, for three years, three months. And um, it consists of uh, improvement of uh, six blocks of daily habits, uh, food, uh, uh, water, physical activity, mental uh, exercises, meditation, uh, bed habits and uh, sleeping. Then, uh, uh, if it's necessary, protocol, pure medical uh, treatments, and uh, additional uh, intravenous, uh, intravenous massage, uh, neurofeedback, different kind of procedures. And very important to do all this together in the same time, implement to enforce one other. And then uh, we track. Um, some parameters, electropuncture diagnostic, uh, and uh, I fulfill questionnaire each day, how I, uh, how I uh, implement uh, the new recommendations for daily uh, recommendations. And uh, each time we, we see each other in my, during my procedure, we discuss and make some uh, conclusions uh, with doctor during visit. And then in three months, we re, re recheck uh, the parameters which we wanted to change uh, based on the big diagnostic, 2,000 parameters. And then each three months, we check, the uh, the, we check the parameters that we wanted to change. And after one year, we make this uh, one big uh, examination. So that's how I do it and how I recommend to do it. Mm -hmm. uh, thank you, Svetoslav. We have one more question. And... Uh... Let me explain how I understand this, this question. So the question is, uh, all these uh, tools and testing devices uh, are useful if we have a strict uh, routine and if we do all what is recommended and we have planned and we uh, uh, do this what is planned. Uh, but how these all um, tools and devices are useful if we don't have such lifestyle. Okay, so <laughs> as far as I understand, uh, these uh, devices uh, will not uh, useful if we don't uh, do recommendations and we, if we don't have a strict uh, uh, routine each day and uh, we don't track results and uh, we don't change uh, uh, what we do. So <laughs> interesting question, but maybe you, <laughs> you have something to add. Yeah, sure. Uh, and Dr. Kaneko, I'll, I'll kick things off. Uh, to give you, again, a little bit more insight into my background, but also my current life, um, I'm involved in quite a number of different companies, uh, but also personally have consulting business, right? I spend roughly about 50 to 60% of my time, maybe a little bit more this year in Amsterdam. The rest of it, I travel around the world. Um, and that leads to this lifestyle that you are describing. And I know you're tuning in from Pakistan, which I think is really, really cool. Uh, but just uh, that lifestyle that you're describing of being the jet setter and bouncing all around the world and not really having a routine. Well, I I've been there. And I also know that what these devices can do is help you set up kind of mini routines for different situations, right? And so rather than having a typical morning routine, maybe you have three different morning routines or four. Um, which is something that I do. Uh, maybe you have a different speaking routine if you're a business person. And all of these devices, what they actually do is help you support the behavior change with the betterment of a goal, so or towards a, a goal. And so Dr. Kaneko earlier outlined what, something that was very, very beautiful, which is we use all of these parameters and help you set goals and help you use it to achieve those goals. And by measuring, we can help get there faster. Well, these devices as you're traveling about will let you know first how this lifestyle and how this crazy we'll use the word craziness but maybe craziness is normal for you uh, is affecting you it can also allow you to know when you may need a little bit more of a rest period it can allow you to see what behaviors that you're engaging in during this lifestyle may not support your life uh, you know we've talked a little bit about alcohol uh, during this and using these quantified self devices, even though I'm traveling around the world, I know and have been able to 
well, effectively eliminate alcohol from my life because I, I've been able to see from the quantified self devices what it's done to me. But you just start to, what the key here is really to just start to set a goal or look at a behavior, put a data point to it, and then you can use that data point as sort of a way to improve. And that is why I think that quantified self actually supports this lifestyle a lot more. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Instead of stuff, will you add something? Yeah, sure. Um, in this question, uh, very big um, depth of this question. Um, imagine that management of your health is like your um, full-time work or your most important business project, the, the highest priority business project. You cannot be successful when you manage something and you just think that you will buy some some device or, or, or hire some, some person and he or she or this device will, will help you to make your, the, the most important, the most complex project of your life successful. You have to pay attention, you have to pay time, you have to pay money, you have to invest, you have to work over it, work hard. You have to put ambitious goals and you have to understand that, that the more healthier you will be, the, more, uh, the longer you will live, the, the, the more happiness will be in your life the more ecological ecosystem you will build around yourself and inside. And of course, uh, it can and it may become routine. But only if you will build this house of this routine, of this new attitude of yourself toward yourself, it will appear. There is no other option. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Svetoslav. Also, I remember... Boomer told us uh, during some of uh, previous uh, talks uh, that uh, uh, when you started your biohacking journey, you bought a lot of uh, devices and uh, used all that, but then you realized uh, that uh, uh, it is very important to have framework and some system. And, and, uh, yeah, and both <laughs> what Svatislav is doing as well as what we do is a framework for your biohacking. So what yeah. do you need to spend time on? What do you not? Okay, we have two more questions uh, and uh, one more question again from uh, Nick. He asked, uh, what, is, uh, what, uh, what do you recommend uh, to start measure for biohacking beginners? Yeah, yeah this question was uh, uh, kind of uh, during the presentation, so I just love already answered it. Uh, so there are like 10 tests uh, you have to start with, right? So oh, okay, okay. this is the main thing and i guess like whoever starting their biohacking journey it's just right thing to start right yeah but the only thing you have to remember that uh, the more questions you put the more answers you get the more new questions you you you, you get so the, the 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 way of knowing yourself better of self-improvement is uh, infinitive it's unlimited so you can start from this test, of course, but for example, as I mentioned, for, for uh, vitamin D, there is direct method how to improve it. But for example, for uh, cholesterol, there is not. You have to implement all this uh, good stuff. I mean, lifestyle, procedures, and so on and so on. Then track, then track more results, and so on. So, but, but at least if each day you get more information about yourself, you take more efforts as in business, then you will get better results. Yeah, Over, thank you, you so much. And also I have uh, good news uh, that I also learned from Svetoslav here, from you, from one of your lectures, uh, that uh, to be biohacker doesn't mean to track uh, 2000 parameters each day. If you start to track uh, at least one parameter more, each day or each next uh, few days uh, you, and uh, you already can uh, uh, count you by hacker. Yes, yes, uh, but uh, uh, not, uh, not only tracking parameters is important. Uh, when you track parameter, it's important to put goals based on these parameters, mm -hmm. then to develop plan and implement this plan and then check results. Uh, yeah, exactly. Uh, yeah, yeah. 
<laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. So, good. Uh, two questions. Uh, I, uh, yeah, I would like to answer. There are many meditation types. So, which one will be effective for serve for the purpose? Um, I, I'll kick things off with. I, I think. I've heard, and look, I've I've done the Transcendental Meditation course as well. Um, I think the important thing, it's universally, it seems universally conclusive that meditation has a benefit. Um, and doing it, the act of doing it, apparently 10 to 20 minutes a day has a benefit. So my encouragement to you is do what will cause you to meditate. That could be a guided meditation to start. That could be something I know when I got into meditation, I had to put the money down for transcendental meditation in order to force myself to actually do it. Um, but now I do different forms of meditation as well. And I guess the short answer is, is do what suits you best. There are plenty of different apps out there now. It could be something like waking up with Sam Harris if you're into the science, neuroscience side of things. Uh, Headspace if you just want a guided meditation. And even you can go as far as transcendental meditation if that suits you. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. I know so, that you yeah. recommend transcendental meditation. So yeah, yeah. Uh, I would, I would, uh, I would um, explain why, uh, because uh, my work, I don't uh, not only practice on myself, I help other people professionally. So it, it provides me opportunity to, to make some practice based conclusion. Uh, there are 112 uh, uh, types of meditation, but uh, they all are good. But we have to thank uh, David Lynch Foundation that this is very strong and powerful organization which pays a lot of attention, including uh, key opinion leaders which uh, spread it, promote it, uh, and helping to remove it from some kind of, you know, um, esoteric, as even a few years ago we, tra we treated uh, meditation as something religious or, 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 or something like that. So they built attitude toward meditation, transcendental meditation, as technology, evidence-based technology. They uh, make uh, uh, studies, and as I know, uh, for the moment in the United States, transcendental meditation runs uh, through procedure of F FDA registration, being registered as uh, medicine, as drug to be reimbursed by uh, uh, insurance companies. That's why uh, the, the mechanism of action is the same, the mental exercises. But... Uh, the background of this technology, the organization, the, the evidence base, the, the et cetera, et cetera, a bit different. That's why, and, and the next thing, mm, of course, if you try to do something by yourself, it's good. But remember that the main, the most important agent is your, in your life, in your health, is you by yourself. But the second thing is uh, another person who can help you. It can be doctor, it can be trainer, it can be physical activity trainer, it can be meditation trainer. Other person based on its experience who can show you and explain you why this is important, how it, is, how, how it works. It changed your attitude. Remember I told you that the, the same physical activity but with different attitude create principally different results. So that's why I would recommend to spend time, to spend money, to find uh, a representative of David Lynch Foundation in your city, to run through training and practice. And after you will see that maybe you will lose motivation, come back to your trainer or to change your trainer and make uh, like re restart of your meditational program. Vedaslav, are you a family doctor? Yes, I am. Okay. <laughs> Can we make an appointment? <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> this is the theme, like, guys, seriously, all the speakers have their practices. So everyone can make an appointment and find them on some Google them. And just like, we have so many great speakers uh, in last four weeks. And I, I think like there will be even more during our next event. So keep in touch. Yeah, yeah. 
So we have last question, and uh, this good question to finalize our great conversation. Where is the where is the demand for biohacking coming from? From the medical field or from people? <laughs> well, very philosophical question, really. <laughs> and and who, who, is, who, is the, who is the author of this question? Can uh, Peter. Yep. Um, Peter, who is Peter still listening. Uh, uh, Dr. Kaneko, do you want to start things off? We can change things up for the last question. If, if you wish, yeah. Uh, how do you think, uh, guys? Maybe let's... From people. Uh, I believe from people. <laughs> yeah, yeah, people. Yeah. So what we are and, building community here, so... Yeah, yeah, that, that's yeah, the most. That's the most. Uh, the the beautiful part of biohacking, that this is not yeah. something artificial, with, that some people professionals uh, developed and uh, force other to do it. For yeah. example, like we have now with this Corona stuff. It's totally opposite. The, the demand from the very beginning started from people. By the way, maybe you know that the uh, biohacking movement uh, appeared in uh, Silicon Valley. Why from there? Because this is the place of concentration of the most effective people in the most competitive environment. And they started to understand that their health, management of their health, because they used to manage everything well, they have to manage their resource to be more productive, more performer, well performed to be more competitive and then they started to attract uh, doctors different doctors who you know, who can help them in different fields and then in 10 years started uh, by hacking clinics being clear but if people would not create this community of biohackers I for example as a doctor I wouldn't even know that this uh, this appear but even before knowing word biohacking, I already did um, management of health as a project. For, it was few words, and with biohacking, it becomes like one word. But very important that it is not medical speci speci specialization. It's an organic evolutionary movement of responsible people who want to take responsibility over their main resource on themselves to live longer and to live uh, better, to understand themselves better and to understand uh, what, what kind of people they want to be and what kind of um, society they want to build around themselves. Yeah. I have a strong uh, feeling uh, that uh, yeah. we will start uh, some retreat tours to Silicon Valley because we have a big amount of some uh, STEM clinics and biohacking community here in Silicon Valley. So, yeah. yes people come <laughs> yeah we are looking forward to uh, when it will be a uh, appropriate time for on-site events and uh, uh, we will host great events in silicon valley so we already invite you for future <laughs> Let, let's do it together yeah uh, thank you very something. much for a great conversation uh, i would like to remind that uh, biohacking congress team together with our experts put in the effort and uh, um, make uh, and put this knowledge in such a framework uh, when more people can accept it so please follow us on social media and jo join our virtual events <laughs> meantime and uh, stay tuned uh, next our event will be on may 30th so it will be an online meetup which will connect uh, entrepreneurs and investors from biotech and digital health area. So it will be an uh, event uh, more about business. There will be a discussion between uh, industry investors about uh, investment to digital health and biotech startups, as well as presentations of selected biotech and digital health startups. There will be more than 10 investors from the industry they will be listening to the presentations of selected entrepreneurs and uh, they will ask their questions and uh, this is one of the goals of biohacking congress so we uh, connect uh, entrepreneurs uh, uh, with investors from the industry and uh, our big uh, virtual biohacking congress will be on july 17th uh, it is event uh, for everyone not just for entrepreneurs uh, 
not uh, only from entrepreneurs and investors from the industry, for everyone uh, who would like to improve for well-being and who would like, uh, who is interested in becoming the best version of yourself. So please join us. Uh, you can find all the lists uh, on our event bread. And links mm, so are fun. in Thanks chat. Thanks again. Make, make sense uh, for hosting with me. <laughs> for your help. Thank you, yeah. Julia. Thank you, guys. It was amazing show. And Thank you, everyone. you have something to add, as I know. Um, just to add at the end, I mean, look, uh, this is a great movement to be a part of, right? And uh, just to in, a debt of gratitude to those who attended tonight. It's not easy to carve time out on a Saturday. And, you know, applause to you for doing so and taking this proactive approach to your health. I just want to encourage everybody to continue to do that, continue with that momentum, because um, that momentum will snowball and success is addictive. And it all starts with just taking action. So congratulations, everyone. And thank you for attending. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Boomer. Thank you for joining Biohacking Congress. And we really hope to see you soon in our next uh, virtual event and on site event in United States and Europe. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, my best wishes goes to you and all around you. Stay safe and stay healthy. Stay classy. Yeah. Thank you. Bye bye.